Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it was fun to have that little cicada chat before we start. Um, I'm Mary Ann Hakes, and I work with Explorations on Aging in College Park. And as many of you know, we have formed um, corridor conversations with the Route 1 villages. So that includes Hyattsville Aging in Place, University Park Helping Hands, Neighbors Helping Neighbors, and Explorations on Aging in College Park. And our idea is to provide, um, uh, I hesitate to call them lectures, conversations of interest to all ages. Um, our emphasis is on seniors as we try to help seniors um, continue to live in their homes if that is their wish. But we will be doing these by Zoom. Um, I guess for the foreseeable future, we've just had a meeting to schedule through um, December. So watch for our, um, our information. And actually, let me use this opportunity to tell you about the next one, which will be Saturday, June 26th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Calling Artworks, It Really Does. And it will be um, artist, educator, and um, a leader, Barbara Johnson of Hyattsville. She's based at Artworks now, and she's going to talk about the many ways that Artworks support um, our own creativity, certainly during this pandemic. And um, I think she'll tell us a great deal about um, art, art, art itself. And then I need to put in a little plug for July, where we talk about Pluto. Um, Doug Hamilton is a neighbor and he's also an instructor at uh, a professor at the University of Maryland and I think you'll find him very fascinating and Pluto is more interesting than you might think. Um, but today I'm delighted to introduce Rich, Rick Borschelt who's also a neighbor um, and Rick's um, claim to fame in our neighborhood is he's a contributor to our neighborhood listserv and so very frequently somebody will be out on a walk take a picture of anything that moves crawls flies and says what is this and rick is always able to respond and usually it's it's humorous so we all get a very much appreciate that rick um rick borschelt is director of the I'm going to read this, excuse me, of the Office of Communications and Public Affairs with the, oh, I didn't write that down. What Department of Energy, Rick? Yes. Um, he also manages the community of, <clears throat> excuse me, the community of practice initiatives, identifying and sharing best practices and communicates insights from the science community, um, from the science communication literature. He, um, it was an under, did his undergraduate and graduate work in natural history and has had a career in science writing, science policy, and science public affairs. He's exper experienced with scientific communications in varied, various pro professional settings, including federal agencies, um, the, office, the executive offices of the president, the uh, Congress, space and technology, and um, he's currently manager of communications for a 600, $6.7 billion portfolio in basic physical sciences research. And he's going to talk to us today about the great caterpillar factory and backyard birds. So welcome, Rick. Oh, excuse me, one minute before you start. <clears throat> um, Rick is going to be <clears throat> excuse me, within the lecture asking you questions. If you would put your answers in the chat box, um, I will summarize them and we'll come up with uh, the answer to Rick's quiz. And then if you have questions, um, we will have a question and answer session at the end of this se uh, session, probably starting around three o'clock. So please put your questions in the chat and then I will refer them to Rick. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rick Borschelt, as Marianne said. I am a science writer and a naturalist by training. Uh, I actually came to the College Park area for graduate work from my um, ancestral home in the Ozarks uh, back in the uh, early, well, late 70s, early 80s, and have been off and on a resident here ever since. Uh, I came back full time uh, from another one of my uh, jaunts uh, looking for greener pastures on the other side of the fence uh, back in 2004, uh, and I live in College Park, and I garden, I do natural history activities, I 
you know, explore nature, particularly in and around our natural areas here, like Artemisia, Patuxent, Governor Bridge. It's a terrific place to be. And, and I have to say, we have it all here in uh, central Maryland. We have the, the beaches are within the, in an easy shot. The mountains are within an easy shot. And we have, of course, the great eastern forests. And we are, you know, pretty much ground central for the eastern forest, or at least what's left of it. And that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So with uh, no, no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And when I do, I'm going to switch into presentation mode. And what you should see on the screen is one of our just really um, emblematic birds of the eastern forest, the wood thrush, which until maybe 10 years ago was a relatively common bird within even in the suburbs here in University Park and College Park, um, even uh, everywhere along the, uh, the, um, the northeast branch and then up and down along the railroad. Unfortunately, you're not going to be hearing the song very much. Um, I was really tickled and I heard a song of wood thrush singing about a week ago. It clearly was on the move and went elsewhere, but uh, there, it went, there it was. And I was you know, always hopeful that we would have a breeding wood thrush in the neighborhood again. Um, and we may have you know, a few scattered ones, but they're just the most beautiful song. And part of what drives my conversation today and will drive our conversation is what's going on with the wood thrush and other eastern forest birds that used to be our backyard birds here within the corridor. So our core conversation today, I'm going to talk you through a couple of different things. Uh, what kinds of birds commonly travel through here? What are some of our sort of typical birds? How and where do they nest? Are they just migrants, passers through, or are they here to stay? What kind of challenges do they face, both in passage, that is during migration, and when they're nesting or trying to establish homes here in the corridor? And what can we do as individuals, as a community, uh, to increase bird biodiversity in our yardscapes? So the first thing I have to do is deliver all the bad news up front, or most of the bad news up front. So in the United States, well, North America, because we're including Canada here, We've lost somewhere on the order of about 3 billion birds since 1970. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, that, kind, that many species. It means that the total count of birds in North America on an annual basis is now 3 billion less than it was in 1970. That's drastic. And you can tell that because a little bit about the slope of that, of that graph line. And when you follow that slope out, that is not a pretty picture. Uh, this is a very dire situation for many, many, many of our birds. And I'm going to tell you that a lot of that has to do with our backyards. And there are things we can do to help turn this around. Now, it hasn't been equally bad for everybody, all the birds. So the bird populations changes since 1970 by their breeding habitat, that is where they nest and raise their young hardest on the grasslands and that's in the middle part of the country and that's almost entirely due to people plowing up the grasslands and planting corn, wheat, and soybeans. Uh, but the next one down, that sort of greenish blue that's all the way across the northern tier of states in Canada, the boreal forests, also have been hit very hard. Not so much because of what's happening in the boreal forests, but because many of those birds are migrants and they pass through here and it's critical that they pass through here and we're letting them down before they get to the boreal forest. They pass through here in the spring, they pass through here uh, in the fall when they return typically to Central and South America. One of the reasons why this is such an important issue for us is because we sit right on in the middle of the Atlantic Flyway and in the narrow piece of the Atlantic Flyway, one of the most heavily trafficked flyways, despite the fact it's not the largest, one of the most you know, heavily trafficked flyways in the United States. And what this means is there are groups of birds that typically use the Atlantic flyway and they'll come from the Caribbean, they'll come from Central America, they'll come from South America, up and somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, typically they'll make landfall and they have a decision. Do they move up the Mississippi flyway or do they move up the Atlantic flyway? And many, many, many of them choose the Atlantic flyway and we'll see why in just a second. 
if you look at radar, <clears throat> um, and this particular radar um, tap was taken at the end of March this year, um, this is what bird migration looks like. So this is somewhere around 17 million birds in the air, and most of them fly at night. Um, this is 17 million birds flying on one single night uh, in and through the mostly Atlantic Flyway. This is the Atlantic Flyway lit up. And we're the first flyway to bloom, we're the first flyway to actually attract things. And there's a reason why this is March 30th. And I can tell you just because I know these, these critters, um, I can tell you that most of these are palm warblers. It's our first warbler species that migrates through the area. They don't nest here and they're headed up to Canada, well, northern, northern tier states in Canada to, to breed, to lay their eggs, to hatch, and then they'll be coming back through uh, on the way back down. When they fly up in the spring, they have a song, they're singing, they're, they're pair bonding, and so you're, they're very visible, they're very active, they're very... Uh, um, uh, photogenic even. People are photographing them all the time. Going back, say, three times the number go back because they're, they're all the old birds plus the new birds from the year. We almost never see them. The fall migration, while it's three or four times bigger than the spring migration, is a silent migration. Uh, they're not singing, they're not very active, they're just, they're feeding and, and moving south to, into their uh, wintering areas. This is an amazing thing because if you see the highest spot, the highest spot sits right over the top of Virginia into Maryland, and that's an important place, and I'll tell you why that's an important place. Here's a very um, uh, good example of the kinds of passage, birds of passage, the migrants that move through here. And I picked the black pole warbler because within the last week or so, you, this is the one of the last warblers to migrate. So they, they don't all migrate at the same time. Palm warblers are among our first, black poles are among our last. Uh, and you'll see all these, these triangles here up and down the eastern seaboard that are known as stopover sites. This is where we're seeing them all the time in their migration both north and south. They don't stay here. They end up all the way through into uh, northwest Canada. This, they're some of the longest distance migrants. And they do most of that. They, they get here and they stay a week or two weeks, fatten up. They're, they're, they're using the forest here to do that. We'll talk about why. And then they move on. And they have to be in really good shape when they leave here. If they don't get the food and the energy they need here, First of all, they're exhausted and depleted because they made that cross uh, oceanic flight. They're, they're just living on fumes when they make landfall along the Gulf Coast. They fatten up, they, they reach our area, they continue to uh, power up and, and figure out you know, what they're gonna be doing and how quickly they can get to their uh, nesting grounds. And then they make the rest of that flight, most of it, much of it nonstop. So they have to have the best resources available for them here, or they'll never be able to make it to their nesting grounds, or they'll never be able to actually be able to nest, lay eggs. Their bodies will actually take their eggs back inside. And if they don't have enough energy, they'll, they'll reuse their eggs. The black poles you would have heard if you were sitting out in your, on that second cup of coffee that Marianne was talking about uh, earlier uh, in, our, in our general conversation. Uh, you would have heard this as a very high pitched little tss, 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 not really a song at all to us, but birds have incredible hearing. They have hearing that can distinguish and differentiate all the different uh, males, even though they all sound alike to us. And one of the disadvantages of growing older and being a birder is the first thing for many of us to go is in fact our hearing and that particularly goes in those in those upper ranges and that's where most of the warbler songs are is in those upper ranges so that's black pole warbler and we're just going to think about that as an example of the birds who pass through here during their migration and then there are some other birds that typically pass don't pass through here so much but they come here some go farther north but many of them stay here like the wood thrush that we were talking about earlier as part of that general decline in North American birds, Eastern forest birds are also one of the very hard hit 
populations. Wood thrush is a great example. Since 1970, six out of 10 wood thrushes no longer exist. I mean, not individual birds, but that's the population impact. Six out of 10 have, uh, uh, have been lost since 1970. That's an amazing impact on this bird in particular. Overall, it's about 17% of all the eastern forest birds, but wood thrushes in particular have been bad, badly, badly hit. This is why eastern birds, the ones who nest here and stay here and raise their, raise their young here, and the boreal birds who are going to be nesting in the boreal regions of Canada and North, uh, North New England and the Maritimes, this is why they're here. No, they're not here for the rocks. They're here for these trees. They are here for this pretty much still in many areas continuous and contiguous green sea that is the thing that they have depended on for millennia and it is becoming a, a very scarce resource and a resource that is something we have got to preserve for them or there will be no birds. I think you need to do the admit before I can move forward. I did. So <clears throat> the title for the conversation we're having today comes from an op-ed I wrote for the Baltimore Sun a few years ago called The Great Caterpillar Factory. And here's why we think of this as the Great Caterpillar Factory. These trees are, in fact, don't think of them as trees. Think of them as factories. They're factories that produce oxygen for us. They're factories that produce clouds and rain because all the transpiration from the soil comes up through the leaves and goes back into the atmosphere. But they're also a powerful engine of migration and a powerful engine of bird thri birds thriving in the uh, suburban, even suburban areas here in, in, the, uh, uh, in the east. There was a time, of course, it's probably, you probably learned in high school or in grade school that before European colonization, a squirrel could get up in a tree in Maine and not touch the ground until it got back to Florida. Uh, that, that, was, that was how it was able to, that's really not true. Um, there were lots and lots of habitats. Some were uh, cleared by indigenous peoples by fire. Many of them were cleared by natural fires. Here, we're not a really a climax fire ecosystem. That, that means that you, know, you don't get renewal through fire, you get renewal through ice storms and hurricanes. So in previous years, before we had people to clear the forest, there would be hundreds of thousands of acres sometimes taken down in a massive ice storm. And that would be something that regenerated and rejuvenated uh, the forest and, and allowed it to come up and, and, uh, and reclaim itself. Before 1900, every third tree you saw here would be American chestnut. They all died out in the 20s and 30s from chestnut blight, which had a terrific impact, serious bad impact on the, uh, uh, on the forest ecosystem in the east, mostly because that was the dominant tree in the, in the ecosystem. The most important caterpillar producer in the forest. And so that had a big impact on birds, but because we weren't looking at them at a population level, it's hard to know what kind of an impact that had. But overwhelmingly, the, maw, the caterpillars of moths, not so much butterflies, but the caterpillars of moths fuel the journey of migrating birds en route to the areas in the north woods in Canada. Overwhelmingly, it's moth caterpillars that sustain the nesting and fledging of resident breeding birds in our backyards. And overwhelmingly, these caterpillars come from large canopy trees which are in shorter and shorter and shorter supply. And that's especially true in our suburban areas. Here's the example. If you look at our common little chickadee, this is Carolina chickadee, 6,000 caterpillars are required to feed just one nest of chickadees. It's probably four, four birds to fledging, 6,000 caterpillars. They have to forage, they have to get them off of the trees and they have to bring them to their, to their young. And until the young are ready to get out of the nest, it requires 6,000 of those caterpillars to, to get those birds out of the nest. That's an amazing number. And, and, and one of the things I do when I teach, uh, teach bird behavior to kids 
is I give them a little, little pill jar and I say, okay, you're a mama bird now. You go out and you find me 20 caterpillars in the next 20 minutes. Because that's really about what you're looking at. 20 caterpillars in 20 minutes or so. About a caterpillar a minute uh, will get you through, through this during the heavy feeding areas. And they can't do it, of course. I can't do it. You guys can't do it. Um, this is an exceptional breeding um, um, feeding and breeding strategy but it requires just constant, constant work. And it requires that there be a lot of caterpillars to feed from. If you want to feed the birds, and we think you should, first, you have to feed the bugs. The birds depend critically. They can't switch off to other things. They can't switch off to bird feeders. They can't switch off to mosquitoes. They can't switch off to Cicadas. I mean, the cicada um, year is going to be really good for a lot of big birds, not so much for for warblers and smaller birds, but you know it's going to be really good for them. It means that their nest success this year will be terrific, the, particularly the second and third broods. And there'll be a lot of birds next year, but that'll go down really quickly again when there are no no uh, cicadas to eat next year. Caterpillars are an annual resource. It's a renewable resource. And we are in the middle of the great caterpillar factory lands. Now, it's not just that every tree is very useful, or even any canopy tree is really, really useful uh, to help keep this caterpillar factory going. You really need native plants. If your chickadee is choosy, the chickadee is going to choose yards with native plants in it. And only yards that have about three quarters of all the biomass, that is all, if you took all the leaves together and, and weighed them, that's the biomass. Yards need to have more than 70% of native biomass in order to support a chickadee, um, a chickadee nest. Now you would think, well, why is, why is that the case? Why, why don't they like my Japanese cherry trees? Why don't they like my crepe myrtles? Why don't they like my weeping willow? Why don't they like all these things that I've planted here that are beautiful and I love? Well, it's because they're not native here. And because they're not native here, there are not moth species that are adapted to feed on them. And the moths that are adapted to feed on things are adapted to feed on native plants. So you need to have a yard that has a lot of native biomass in it. Now, I'm not, I, I you know, we, we call ourselves sometimes native Nazis um, when, when we talk about you only can have native plants in your yard. I want 100% native yard. I don't have 100% native yard. I like my peonies too much. I like my roses too much. But I have an overwhelming abundance of native plants, and I try to strive for a diversity that includes a large percentage of native plants. This is the biggest threat to, to the factory, to the the, right now, this is the biggest threat to the factory, cutting down of the canopy trees. And this is a, something that we're seeing all over the corridor now, particularly in College Park, University Park, places that historically have had a terrific large canopy layer. And we're cutting them down and replacing them with smaller little trees that are sort of cottage sized. And there are a lot of reasons why people do this, a lot of good reasons why people do this. You don't want this big, this was an oak, you don't want this big oak falling on your house. You don't want it falling on your utilities. Um, you don't want it in, infiltrating your, your sewer drains. Um, on the other hand, without that canopy, we will not have birds. We'll have some birds, there are some birds that don't need it, but the great caterpillar factory will not exist and those passage birds and those nesting birds that we love so much are not gonna be able to survive here for much longer. The second biggest threat, pesticide use. This time of year, the biggest threat, I have to say, is Mosquito Joe and his cousins. Because even though they tell you, oh, it's only going to kill mosquitoes, there is no insecticide that only kills mosquitoes as adults. If you're fogging for mosquitoes, it's going to kill a lot of things, including caterpillars. Now, someone might say, well, that doesn't bother me so much. But if you go into a yard where you have treated with Mosquito Joe, or another one of the companies that does the pyrethrin or other fogging, you will find that if you had a, a, a bird nest that was thriving, it'll probably starve to death. The birds, the fledgings will probably starve to death because there now is no longer uh, sufficient uh, um, 
uh, insect life in that yard to be able to sustain them. But birds need more than food. And I talk a lot about the caterpillar factory because that really is the, the linchpin. And that's really why birds are in such decline here in the East. Uh, it's because they're losing you know, the, the biggest, bar none, the biggest problem with birds is habitat loss. And the habitat loss is food loss that we're talking about here, uh, particularly in, uh, um, in the form of moth caterpillars uh, moving forward. In the boreal forest, they have a similar situation. Spruce budworm is a particularly, um, it's the smorgasbord for the, for the boreal birds. When they get up there and they settle down to nesting, they fattened up here on our eastern caterpillars because it's early. I mean, when you get to the boreal forest, it's still pretty darn cold. But by the time they get up to the boreal forest and they nest and they lay their eggs and their eggs hatch, It'll be warm enough there for them to then begin to, to be able to feed that they're young and then their young feed on spruce budworms primarily or other evergreen um, caterpillars. Well, foresters like to minimize spruce budworms because it takes out some of the forestry and the forests don't grow right and the trees don't grow tall and thin like they like them to and straight. Um, so there's a lot of spraying across the, the boreal forest and that, of course, takes out the spruce budworm and all the foods for the birds. But the birds need more than food. They need the same things we do. They need shelter. Well, they need water. And we'll talk about <clears throat> water in a little bit. But and water is a particularly issue, a particular issue here because birds don't like to fly very far from their from their nest because that leaves their nest undefended. And that makes them vulnerable to predation by hawks and other things as they move you know, between habitats, sometimes over large stretches of open space. Um, so you want to have their water close to them, and we don't have a lot of water often in our backyards, particularly in a dry spell like this. Most of the, if you have a, a, a bird bath, that's a great thing. Most people don't provide water resources for birds, and that means that for sometimes entire blocks, you don't have a good water resource available when it's dry like it is today. Water is one thing they need. Shelter also is what they need. They need shelter from predators. They need shelter from storms. They need shelter from intense heat and, and, uh, and sunshine. And they need shelter for a place to build their nest. So I want to talk to you about a couple of uh, birds that, that we have historically had here in the uh, corridor, some of our common nesting birds for a long time. And I want to sort of test your knowledge about what these birds have in common. So here are the birds that I'm going to talk about today, and you're going to answer a question here in a second. So Marianne, get ready. Um, Eastern bluebirds, one of our just terrific uh, um, common, formerly very common birds uh, here up and down the corridor. That's the one left-hand side. Tufted titmouse, that's the bird in the lower left-hand corner. Um, they're also a very energetic, very active bird. Um, they're sort of like a dra gray drab version of cardinals. And then the largest picture is red-bellied woodpecker. A lot of people say this is red-headed woodpecker, and you would make sense to call this a red-headed woodpecker because that has a lot more red on its head than it does on its belly. But if you look there under the leg, you'll see that red splotch. That's why it gets its name as red-bellied woodpecker. You don't don't ask me to uh, to apologize for why it's stupid common names sometimes happen. This is a stupid common name, but this is red-bellied woodpecker. This is the male. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you were looking at these three birds, I want you to go into the chat and tell me what you think they have in common. What is the factor that draws these three birds together? I'll give you about 30 seconds and then Marianne's going to read some of your answers. While I cough. <coughs> <coughs> All right, we got some good answers in here. 
think you're muted, Marianne. We do. Um, you'll be proud. People are paying attention. Excellent. Um, I knew they were. Uh, um, they eat insects is a large, uh, a lot of people say they eat insects, they eat bugs to the extent that they're synonymous. Um, they are cavity nesters, the type of tree matters. Um, they love cicadas. And then somebody wrote, I have no idea. And this praise presentation is amazingly informative. <laughs> so I like all those answers. Um, I would, yeah. But the answer that I was looking for is these are all cavity nesters. Uh, they are birds. They are birds that live and spend their time as uh, nesting in, the, in holes in trees, particularly large trees. Uh, and they tend to figure out where they can nest based on how high up they can and how far away from uh, predators they can be. In many cases, um, tit mice, and that's the tit mouse in the lower, in the middle uh, corner, middle uh, small picture there. And bluebirds have been particularly hard hit by the loss of trees because as soon as something starts to get sick, what do we do? We cut it down. And we only want healthy trees. We only want trees that have lots of green leaves. We don't want any dead limbs. Without dead limbs and without dead snags, you don't get cavity nesters. Now we've been able to some extent to supplement the availability of cavities, and we call these cavities, I call them holes, but scientists call them cavities. Um, we are able to supplement them with bluebird houses and bluebird houses have rescued basically the Eastern bluebird population. But what's, I don't know why, population. And bluebirds are, tend to be, I think, one of our most iconic birds here. You can still see quite a few of them at uh, Protection Wildlife Refuge. You can see them at Lake Artemisia. Um, they like to have open areas next to woods, but they need cavities. They need cavities to live. And the biggest threat to them is we cut down the large trees. As Soon as they get a couple of dead limbs, you know, we call in the arborist who also moonlights as a tree remover. And, and the arborist says, oh my God, your tree is dying. We have, to, we have to cut it down. It's a hazard to human health. You know, I don't know anyone um, recently who's died from having a, a limb fall on them from a dead tree, but it's possible. We worry about these things. We do know they fall on houses. We do know they fall on utility lines. Um, but nevertheless, if we get rid of all the cavities, we get rid of all the cavity nesters. There's also pressure on the cavity nesters because there are introduced birds that are also cavity nesters that compete for the dwindling number of holes that there are. European starlings and house sparrows, English house sparrows, domestic house sparrows, both are introduced here. They were not here uh, originally and they're both cavity nesters and they will outcompete. I've seen starlings pull young woodpeckers out of the holes, throw them to the ground and then take over the hole. Uh, so we need more cavities, and if we can't have the cavities, it's up to us to put up birdhouses that, re that reproduce the cavities uh, to the maximum extent that we possibly can. The ability of birds to use um, nest boxes is terrific, uh, but it's no substitute for the kinds of things we see in, in, in nature in the cavities. All right, got three more for you. <clears throat> Going to talk about a little warbler. Uh, it's the one on the big picture. It's called an oven bird, and you'll hear it calling teacher, teacher, teacher. There are still a few left in the neighborhood. I heard one down and it's probably going to be nesting down in Calvert Park. Uh, and we hear them, you, you'll see them along in some of the woods uh, in, in and around the Wells Ice Rink and, and elsewhere, but they're rapidly dwindling. Um, American woodcock. You don't see this very often, but many of us have these in our yards, um, in, particularly in March and April, and may even see or hear their signature courtship sky, it's called sky dance. They do a courtship, usually it's right at dusk and you can barely hear it or see it. Um, but they often nest in our area and you won't see that unless you happen to stumble onto their nest and scare them up. And then Eastern Tohi, or it used to be called Rufus Sided Tohi. I liked Rufus Sided Tohi better, but you know, there are other Rufus Sided Tohis that don't live in the East. So this is the Eastern Tohi. 
So I'm going to ask Marianne again to take up the uh, the aggregator mold and tell me what do these three birds, all in decline in the corridor, have in common? Watching my stopwatch, so I don't have much time to give you. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, audience says they are ground nesters, um, and one says they're facing, <clears throat> excuse me, facing competition, and there are no cavities for them. So three different answers. So I've, I've got a ringer in here somewhere, a naturalist ringer who knows who knows his or her birds, her or his birds. These are in fact ground nesters. All of these birds nest on the ground. Uh, oven bird, which is the large picture on the left of Pickle in Green Ridge State Forest uh, two years ago. This is why it's called an oven bird. If you've seen the uh, typical indigenous ovens of the Southwest or, or even the, the Spanish uh, as part of their conquest adapted this model, these sort of dome-like ovens. That's why it gets its name. It's an oven bird. And this nest is built on the ground. The top right picture is Rufusite tohi built on the ground, typically with a little bit of overhanging stuff. This was a picture taken in um, uh, Western Maryland also at Finzel Swamp. And then there's the um, the woodcock, uh, otherwise you know, known as a timber doodle, uh, and it doesn't even bother with the nest. It just you know plops down and and lays its eggs on top of a couple of dead leaves, and that's it. The woodcock. It's interesting. You'll see the woodcock. Uh, you know, if you see it at all, it's only when you flush it, as I've said. But they can be in a wood in a shrub border. Um, the, my backyard neighbor, my next door neighbor's yard is sort of overgrown at the moment because it's it's a it's a house that hasn't been kept up for a while and there's no one living in it. And I flushed a woodcock out of there earlier in the season. I suspect she's nesting in there now. Um, and if she's able to succeed nesting, it'll be a pretty good of a miracle because this is the biggest threat to ground nests is people deciding they would like to have a lawn instead of having shrubs, trees, and understory plants. Um, for many birds, this is, this is a desert. This is an absolute desert. The real exceptions to this really are starlings and American robins. American robins, because they feed on a particularly new resource that we provided them, and same, same thing with starlings, and I'll talk about that, I think, in a little bit later. Second biggest threat to them, yeah. In the U.S. alone, every year, between one, uh, one and a half and four billion birds are cat prey. Um, the majority, the I wouldn't say the majority, the close, it's a large percentage of these are cats that don't have an owner. They're they're out in the neighborhood. They're feral cat colonies, or they're they're just out there and no one's taking care of them anymore. But almost half of them are cats that are owned by people and allowed to roam free. Which, by the way, in Prince George's County uh, is illegal. Uh, we'll just say that. <clears throat> but this is a particularly big problem for ground nesting birds because it's, I haven't seen a successful ground nesting bird clutch in College Park in probably the last five years primarily because they've been predated by cats. All right, here's your last three. I've got three more birds for you. Uh, and you're gonna tell me in a second what, they're, what they have in common. I think everybody's real excited by the big bird that we have on the left, the yellow crowned night heron. We're lucky because we have, these are oh, twice the size of a crow. They're large birds. Uh, and we're so excited that we have them actually nesting in University Park and in College Park and have had for a number of years now. And they feed on crayfish, which they fish out of some of the local lagoons and over on the Northeast Branch. <clears throat> Baltimore Oriole, our state bird, that's the bird in the top right, nests uh, in the area also, as does red-shouldered hawk. Uh, 
which is the bottom bottom birds or commonest um, uh, hawk uh, species resident here. <clears throat> and you're going to tell me what these three have in common. Take to the chat. <clears throat> There's a great, lovely nest of uh, um, red shouldered hawks uh, in Calvert Park uh, last year and this year, too. They recently fledged also. All right, audience says. Uh, they build nests high in trees. They nest in trees generally. They're herbivorous. Um, they eat fish and need water and need water. Well, they all need water. They don't need quite so much. Uh, um, the, the one that needs to be near water habitats is night crowned, yellow crowned night heron and its cousin black crowned. Surprisingly, so does um, many times the, uh, the red-shouldered hawk because they feed primarily on frogs and snakes. That's their biggest prey items, at least when they're near when they're near water. And frankly, so does Baltimore Oriole. They like to be around water. In fact, they like to build their nests. The correct answer here was they need high canopy trees to build their nests in. Baltimore Orioles build their nest way over, typically way over a uh, uh, a stream if they are able to do that, but somewhere high in the canopy where they build, and this is a, a male uh, in the process of helping his uh, mate build a nest, um, and the nest is in is not quite complete yet, but it'll be that deep pendulous woven nest that is so typical of the Orioles. That's the um, red-shouldered hawk. This is a picture I took uh, last year uh, down um, Again, just behind uh, Wells Ice Rink and one of the big maples down there. And then this picture here on the right is not our local night crown heron, but that's where the, that's about the size that the chicks are right now. They're just beginning to pin out and feather out and they'll be flying before you know it. What's their biggest threat? I think you're seeing a pattern here. It's the elimination of the big canopy trees. Baltimore Orioles are not going to nest in a and you know, set up set up shop in a crepe myrtle. They're not going to set up shop in your cherry tree. They're not going to set up shop in even the little dogwood that you plant in your front yard. Um, they need those large canopy trees to get them out of the range of their biggest uh, threats, which are predators. Now, not everybody, as I was saying earlier, does badly in the suburbs. Um, you have two birds looking at the feeder. One's the European starling. That's the big bird on the right. And the bird on the left at the feeder there is the Euro is a European import also, the English house sparrow or domestic house sparrow. Both of them were introduced. Um, house sparrows were actually probably got out before then, but both of them were reintroduced to make sure they were successful by a gentleman who just thought it was really important to have every bird in Shakespeare should be somewhere in the United States. So he spent decades trying to import them all, never succeeded with things like nightingales, but boy, he succeeded with European starlings and with uh, English house sparrows. Interestingly, because they have no competition here, they, are, they, just, they went just completely you know, gangbusters in their native habitat, both of these birds are declining just as our birds are declining. Um, they, don't have the, they don't have the same kind of, uh, of resources. And I'll show you what resources they're using in a second. And then American Robin is also doing really, really well, better than it ever used to. And this is why they're doing really, really well. We have altered their landscapes that provide them with new resources that preferentially you know, cater to these, uh, these birds. If you look at the left, those are the larvae, the grubs of Japanese beetles, an introduced species that is now rampant in our yards. And when you see gangs of starlings moving across your yard, shoulder to shoulder, and this phalanx of stabbing beaks, that's what they're stabbing for. Uh, 
If you drive along the Beltway in late March and early April and you see it turn to a sea of white, uh, this is what that sea of white will turn into, the fruits of Bradford pear, which when it was first introduced, and by the way, Prince George's County was the epicenter of introduction for Bradford pear, which was seen as a terrific landscape plant when it was first introduced. It was sterile. It didn't, uh, you know, didn't have nasty fruit that it would drop. Um, as a young tree, it's tightly, compactly pyramidal. It blooms beautifully. The flowers stink. Uh, they smell like carrion because it's not pollinated by normal insects. It's pollinated by flies who are attracted to the smell of rotting flesh and pollinate the flowers. But it was considered sterile. It turns out that the tree is not as good a landscape tree as they thought. It tends to break apart, fall apart during ice storms, and is not very long lived. But it, when we when they introduced other species or other cultivars of Bradford pear, of calorie pear, which was the original, lo and behold, they did become fertile. And now Bradford pears are fertile and really support tremendous numbers of American robins in the wintertime, uh, which feed on this, starlings feed on this. And when they poop after feeding, they drop these seeds all over the place. And that's why you have this huge ghost forest along the Beltway. <clears throat> there was a time, in fact, when um, Prince George's County had Bradford pear as its county tree, um, because everyone thought it was such a great thing. But luckily, that's over with. Our new county tree is willow oak. And then robins you'll see in your uh, in your yard also going on a stabbing spree looking for these things, earthworms. Anyone want to hazard? Well, I, I won't ask you to unmute yourself to that, but uh, I will tell you that until relatively recently, ecologically, like within the last 20 or 30 years, we did not have earthworms in the eastern forests. They were a creature of the agricultural lands in the south and, and areas where there were a lot fewer trees. Um, earthworms, many of them are invasive, introduced from other places, from people who fished in the Midwest and brought them east and fished with them and then released them. They got out. Uh, they are completely altering the eastern forest ecosystem in a bad way. Um, because they're they're uprooting things that should never have been uprooted and the microbial systems, ecosystems there that are so important for many of our native plants are being decimated by earthworms. But there, it's a good news for American robins because American robins feed now almost exclusively on earthworms. They've had a huge population. They robins have had also had a huge population bolstered by the earthworms and bolstered by the fruits we grow in our yard, pyracantha, crab apples, but especially Bradford pear. I want to switch now to sort of sharing with you a couple of things that you as an individual homeowner, you as a citizen in your jurisdiction, you as a Marylander or just a concerned person in general can do and I will say the first thing you can do is plant trees, lots of them, as large as your lot will let you handle. If you have a space in your yard that doesn't grow up in the middle of a overhead utility line, please, gods, plant a large canopy tree there if you don't have one already. That's going to be critical to reversing the decline of birds. But the picture I'm showing you here is an outside picture of um, a suburb of Atlanta where they've had a very aggressive tree replenishment scheme going on. They cleared most of the area around Atlanta. And one of the things that did was create a situation where there was this huge heat island around the Atlanta suburbs. They're be actually beginning to make tremendous strides against that by planting canopy level trees all across the, the, uh, the suburbs. These are about 20, 25 years old now. They were at this uh, quite a while ago. And this is what the Atlanta suburbs can look like. This is what our area can look like again as well. Those of you who mourn the loss of the k property know that you can restore this in 20 to 25 years. You can have this look again in 20 to 25 years, but you have to plant as much of this as possible in large canopy trees. <clears throat> 
You don't just want canopy trees, though. This is the important piece about uh, how do you how do you plant your yard, how do you hand plant your gardens, uh, in order to maximize the biodiversity of birds. You need canopy trees that we've been talking about, but you also need this middle layer of trees, this understory trees, the the bechamel sauce on your lasagna, and then you need the shrub layer uh, that is the the smaller trees, smaller shrubs small trees, large shrubs uh, that allow for cover along the ground. So in an ideal world, if you have a lot, normal sized lot, you'd have one or two from column A, the big canopy trees, two or three from column B, and five or more shrubs from column C, various sizes, some evergreen if you can make that happen. Uh, just make sure it's a good diversity and not all the same things. And here are some things that I would recommend um, I have my preferences based on how well they support birds. Uh, on the left is tulip poplar or tulip tree. Um, and a lot of people don't like it because it's a trashy tree. It drops its leaves, they're hard to rake up. If you park the tree under it or your car under it, it drops this, this sticky sweet stuff that then molds on your car. That's actually not from the tree, it's from aphids and scale insects on the tree that excrete the excess uh, carbohydrates and drop it and mold grows on it. But there's a reason why it's an important one. If you can plant it away from your house in your backyard where it's not gonna overhang, that's a good one to have. Also be aware though, it's shallow rooted. It normally occurs in very damp environments. So because it's shallow rooted, if you tend to, if you happen to uh, remove some of the, the support around it when you do construction or something, it's likely to blow down in a storm. Um, but they're one of our just best candidates for, for planting here. Oak, the middle one, probably our best all around suggestion for planting as a canopy tree. Don't plant all pin oaks, don't plant all scarlet oak, don't plant all white oaks. All of these, we have, we have 20 different species of oaks uh, that you can choose from here in the mid-Atlantic to plant there. Um, and some of them are understory trees. Some of them don't get as big as others, but tr try to plant oaks as canopy trees and try to plant beech as canopy trees too. That's American beech on the right. This is the one you often see people having carved their initials into. And this is where I usually stop and say, you know, the Druids had a, had a stop for that. If you were caught carving into a tree, a living tree and a living beech tree, <clears throat> You would have your belly cut, your intestines nailed to the tree, and you'd be whipped around the tree until your intestines came out. I think there's a time for that. There are time and place for all of these kinds of things. This is why you get extra benefits uh, from, from these things too. And this is why I picked these three. You get acorns, which are an important food crop uh, for lots of animals in the fall. You get beech nuts from beech, which are an important food crop for uh, birds and other animals in the fall. But surprisingly, you get this huge boost of carbohydrate for migrating warblers and for hummingbirds in the spring when tulip tree blooms, because these trees produce just this incredible amount of nectar. You can see it pooling here in the lower lip of one of those petals. And this is a Cape May, warb um, a Cape May warbler that's just finished uh, uh, a meal here and is you know, sucking down some of that really great uh, carbohydrate benefit. Column B, something that's maybe 15, 20 feet tall, grows in deep shade, grows under those canopies. I like to think about my favorite for these is red bud, but also deciduous holly. This is the holly with no leaves on it that drops its leaves in the fall. And amelanchier or shadbush or service berry. Um, and I, I, I prompted when I did the dry run on this, uh, why this was called shadbush, probably easier to guess why it's called shad bush. It blooms at the time that the shad historically moved up and down um, spawning runs in our local streams and rivers. But it's called service berry because it tends to bloom at about the time when the ground thaws. And you could have a funeral service for people who you kept on cold storage who died during the winter and you could actually bury the bodies. And that's at that time you could have your first funeral services of the year. And that's the service berry. Again, you know, you can get a lot of things from them, but our shrub layer, you have a lot of choices. So a couple of things I would recommend is native azalea because it produces a really good uh, crop of nectar for migrating hummingbirds in the spring. 
Elderberry provides a fruit crop in the middle of the summer from things like catbirds, mockingbirds, brown thrashers, cedar waxwings, and spice bush, a native plant that we have along here, gets a nice, really nice, interesting uh, shape, blooms very early, blooms before forsythia. If people think this is forsythia blooming, it's not, it's spice bush, um, it's related to sassafras. And it gets, gets you a twofer, it gets you flowers in the spring for early pollinators, and it also creates, you know, some really nice, uh, uh, nice brown, uh, nice red uh, uh, berries in late, in the, late in the year. So this is <clears throat> my backyard, looking out my yard to the neighbor's house. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to layer, the second thing you do, you want to layer your yard with shrubs and mixed plants and not lawn. So what you see here, you have the large canopy trees in back. This happens to be a, a red oak. There, there's another red oak here. There's a willow oak uh, just to the right of that. And then there's the understory area. There's this large viburnum, which is a native plant. This is a small, and it's kept small by regularly pruning, um, magnolia, evergreen magnolia. A number of other uh, small shrubs and tree, uh, shrubs in here, and then I'll, I'll understory trees and then a real shrub layer and you'll see that again i'm not a strict nativist i have roses in here i have roses that take a lot of shade this happens to be one of the knockout roses called nearly wild i have a shrub in here called hearts of buston which is a native euonymus sometimes called eastern wahoo it's called eastern it's called hearts of buston because their seed capsules in the fall turn red and they have these four chambers and it looks sort of like a heart and then when they are ripe they burst open and release these big, gorgeous uh, orange berries. So, and then you can see I, there's figs down here too. There's buttonbush, which is native. There's plethora, which is native. So this is a, a good mix for me. 70% or more of this would be native biomass. And I do have chickadees and I do have tip mice. Third thing you can do, build a brush pile. Why is that important? Um, it's important because birds need shelter and they need cover. They especially need cover from arboreal hawks because we, you know, we make this really easy for hawks to come in and swoop in and take birds out. But also they need it, they need the protection from the elements and they need the protection from cats. So uh, brush piles, easy to make, easy to maintain. Um, if you don't like the looks of them, you can plant screening things around them. I have two, they are just the, the lives of my yard, um, birds in and out of those brush piles. I, I'm the one who comes around and scavenges your, your Christmas trees when you throw them out at the end of the year. And before the city comes to get them and makes mulch out of them, I usually steal a couple to put in my brush pile. And that's the basis of my brush pile every year. Four, add a water resource. Some sort of water feature doesn't have to be, um, the one in the, on the right hand side is a bubbling one that's the best, but it doesn't have to be it can be still water if you have still water like the ones in the, in the left and the middle. Make sure that every now and then I mean like once a week or so uh, you pour some Clorox in there and disinfect it and, and uh, put fresh water fresh water every day. And then curb the cat. No, it doesn't look all that unhappy sitting there watching but you know. It has a green tomato plant there to keep it company. Cats are not compatible with the ecosystem in the East. So think about, now that we're talking about the, the infrastructure plan, think about our green infrastructure plan. Put these caterpillar factories back to work. Um, this happens to be something called the ugly nest caterpillar, the, one of the best food sources for uh, for our spring migrants uh, moving through. They're usually done by the time our birds settle down to nesting here in the area, but the green infrastructure plan is all about planting some more canopy trees. Thank you very much for your kind attention this afternoon. Um, you can tell I'm very passionate about birds. I had my first pair of binoculars when I was six years old and I haven't put them down since. I've gotten better binoculars, but I uh, haven't, haven't, haven't given up on the binoculars ever since. Um, there's my email if you'd like to get back in touch with me. I also have a, a website. My real passion is uh, butterflies. I maintain the website leplog at wordpress.com. 
Um, Marianne or anyone else who wants to share this presentation are welcome to do so. Or if you can email me, I'll be happy to send it as well. Happy to take questions. I'll stop screen sharing now, so we can be back. In Thank you, Rick. That was that was fascinating. Um, I just uh, having seen the. Um, I'm pulling up the chat. Having seen the um, the rehearsal, um, you'd think I'd be an expert, but it was really so interesting. Our first question was. Um, early on and someone wondered last summer tent caterpillars tried to kill my baby pawpaw tree what butterfly mo or moth comes from tent caterpillars and how best should i deal with them and she lives in greenbelt they are in fact uh tent caterpillar moths called the eastern tent caterpillar um there are not a lot of birds that eat hairy caterpillars so if you looked at them you know that they're very hairy uh, gypsy moths look very much the same way um, Eastern forest caterpillars look much the same way. And those hairs are designed to keep, uh, to keep them from being uh, eaten by predators, particularly birds and spiders, their other big predator. Uh, the nest also helps keep them from being predated by parasites. The other big issue and, and, and uh, um, problem for many of the caterpillars is that they're easily parasitized by tiny wasps that put their egg inside the body cavity, the eggs hatch out, the, the maggots, the larvae, eat, the, eat, the, uh, eat everything but the central nervous system. So they don't kill the caterpillar until the very end. So they're very selective about that. Um, but that web, that, that nest protects them from the parasitoids and to some extent from, from, butter, from uh, bird predation as well. The birds here that eat hairy, hairy caterpillars You'll often see blue jays do that, but in particular the cuckoos, black-billed and yellow-billed cuckoos. Cuckoos are, are death from the sky for hairy caterpillars. And we don't have a lot of those because we don't have a lot of caterpillars anymore and it requires a lot. Not, a, not all the caterpillars are hairy and that's their specialty. But you will see, we call them, growing up in the, in the Ozarks, we call them rain crows because they often sing right before a heavy rain with their typical rain song. Hmm. The best way to get rid of them is by A, cut, the, cut off the, the nest. They usually are in the nest during the day and then they emerge at night to feed. Cut off the nest, burn it. Um, next question. Are black walnut, elms, and river birch native? Uh, yes, black walnut is native. Yes, river birch is native. Depends on what kind of elm. Many elms are native. Uh, most elms, uh, many elms are native here. Um, elms are hard to, um, American elm is hard because it's uh, subject to Dutch elm disease. Slippery elm and some of the other elms are smaller. They don't get the same size. Um, many people have taken to planting Japanese Dalkova to replace, uh, um, to replace Dutch elm or American elms. The problem with American elm, this is the problem with everybody. Um, with you know, every time we plant something, we like uh, we liked American elms. So every every city in the, in the United States had a main street lined with Dutch with American elms because it was beautiful. These beautiful vase shaped trees. They turn a nice, pleasing shade of yellow or gold in the in the summer in the fall. Um, they're just lovely trees, no question about it. When Dutch elm disease was introduced, it wiped them all out. And so you have every place you had an American elm, it's gone, it's dead. Um, they have a couple of trees down on the National Mall still, but they've spent literally millions of dollars to keeping from dying by injecting them with certain kinds of uh, uh, chemicals every year. It's not gonna last forever. And we are working on trying to get new um, resistant species, um, and resistant cultivars of elm that resist Dutch elm disease but it's a long uphill battle. Uh, a good substitute for elm is hackberry. Hackberry has the advantage of not being tasteful to uh, gypsy moths and also having berries that it produces in the uh, summer and fall. It's also the um, host plant for hackberry, hackberry emperor and uh, tony emperor butterflies. Black walnut is a good tree to plant depending on where you're planting it. Know that black walnut is a bully. It kills other plants that grow underneath it. 
the roots are toxic. It secretes a toxic uh, chemical that tries to kill out all the other things that try to grow underneath it. So there are many times I, I you know, we were talking about Doug Hamilton lately. We have a, we have a joint custody of a, uh, um, of a black walnut on, on the fence between our two properties. Um, and I can't grow tomatoes anywhere near it because as soon as the beginning of the year, the roots will kill the, the tomatoes or anything else in the garden. I still like it because it produces a lot of caterpillars and it produces, you know, food mostly for squirrels, food in, in the fall. It uh, doesn't it seem to hurt bamboo. We have one the birds planted in with the bamboo and uh, the bamboo thrives. So. Um, next question, are robins a source of West Nile virus? Not really. The, the birds that are, and, and when you say source, that's a good, you know, something to be careful about thinking. So um, we are a source of West Nile virus. When we get sick, mosquitoes come and, you know, take our blood and pass it to other, um, to other animals, other vertebrates. Um, typically, many of the birds that we see can sustain West Nile virus and not get sick and not die. However, when West Nile takes hold in, a, in an area, the birds that suffer the most because they have less immunity are what we call the corvids. The crows, ravens, and jays are especially heavily hit. Sometimes blackbird colonies are very heavily hit. Uh, it's much worse for the birds than it is for us. We, they have no uh, defenses, chemical or otherwise. They have no family doctor or patient first to go to when you have West Nile virus, um, they die. Now, it's easier to get rid of the mosquitoes than it is to get rid of the birds. So, you know, it doesn't require much to protect yourself from West Nile virus. It requires a can of off spray that you have at your back door when you go out in the yard. Um, what birds eat slugs? So robins will eat slugs. Most of them will eat slugs. The problem is, well, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a test for you guys. Why are birds not effective predators of slugs? And I'll, I'll ask you to put that in the chat and I can watch it now that I'm not sharing. So I'll watch and see. Take to the chat and tell me. Carter's got a good answer. Yeah, Bonnie's, Bonnie's nailed it. Um, slugs are out at night. Birds are not feeding at night. Slugs are hiding during the day. Um, you will see some birds, oven birds, we talked about earlier. Uh, they, they will go in, they'll, they'll turn leaves over, they'll look under leaves. Um, rufous side towhee will do the same thing. A lot of the birds that nest in that sh on the ground in that slug that uh, shrub layer, they're also the ones that you'll see feeding on on slugs. Good answers. Hmm. Um, another question: We grew up thinking earthworms in our compost pile, as well as worms in our garden, were great. Um, you are now saying no. Um, what should we do if we have them in our gardens? That that barn door for that's already closed. There is no going back, putting that genie back in the bottle. Um, I think what you try to do um, is you want to favor native earthworms uh, as much as you can. The worms that are in your compost, the little red wrigglers, are usually uh, native birds or native earthworms. It's the big jumping earthworms that are the problem. You'll see if they're they're Japanese invasives. Um, the only way to get rid of earthworms once they are there is to saturate the soil with some kind of chemical. And that's, I think, worse than having the earthworms. Um, I'm not sure the depth of this question, but what about mulberry trees and bushes? So I love mulberries. Um, we only have one native mulberry, and that's red mulberry. And that's not the one you're seeing around here all the time. The one you're seeing around here and the one you, you know, yell when you walk out in the morning and your, your car has been parked under the mulberry tree overnight and it's nothing but these big purple splotches. Um, that's not a native mulberry, that's white mulberry. It's very popular with uh, fruit eating birds, with robins, with woodpeckers will eat fruit because it's just, I mean, it's there, right? 
um, it's just this, this great little sugar burrito and everybody eats the eats those. They're actually quite, uh, quite delicious and I make pie out of them myself. However, um, you know, if, if you wanted to, to plant the native mulberry would be, it would be red, red mulberry. There's a big mulberry tree on Guilford. Have you discovered it? Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Lisa says we're not obviously not going to cut down existing canopy trees in her yard. Um, that they are be, they being black walnut and elm and various tulip magnolia, some hollies and a blue spruce. I have planted a river birch, but do not have a lot more room given that I have a dogwood and crepe myrtle. What do I do? What can I do? Uh, well, there's lots of things you can do. What 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 are you comfortable doing? I think is the question here. Um, a couple things that I that I would recommend here. I mean, I I, I inherited three crepe myrtles um, that I love. I'm the only thing that gets any value out of them. Their birds have no value, and there's no value for the birds. Mm -hmm. No insect pests. They're they're just pretty for those three weeks a year that they bloom. But by God, they're the only thing blooming, and they're beautiful. If I were trying to remake that part of the yard, though, crepe myrtle would be the first thing to go, and I'd replace it with a native, with a shad bush or a red bud or something like that. Um, what I would think about doing so the hollies, depending on how big they are, the black walnut. If you're looking at the tulip magnolia, which are the small understory level trees, you, know, you still have a place for a large canopy tree. Now, by the time that large canopy tree gets big enough to begin shading these other things out, it's going to be so large. I mean, it's going to take a while to get there, and these other trees are going to be sort of on their on the wane anyway. So you want to look for additional understory trees and shrub trees that are shade tolerant. And you can still have a large canopy tree that grows up over all of those. I'd grow something that if you like the trees you have now, I would grow something that is slow growing, a big chestnut oak, a, an American beech, uh, all of those things. And the birch uh, is one of my, it's one of the least used and one of my favorite plants, uh, um, tree selection, species selections that I can recommend. They're great for producing caterpillars. <clears throat> they're, they're outstanding winter interest because they have that great exfoliating bark that looks so interesting. Um, they're kind of a trashy tree. They're hard to, to, to rake under, but they're great. Um, what I would say about that is they're also, because they grow fast, they tend to be relatively short-lived. I mean, short lived to me is like 40 years, 50 years. That's not short lived in general, but short lived for a tree. Um, the oaks are 300, 400 years old. Um, how do we chase away those pesky crows or should we? Oh, A, figure out why they're being pesky to you. Um, you know, I have crows in the backyard. Um, I sometimes put out um, a little bit of dog food for dried, small dry dog food uh, that some of the larger birds, blue jays, like to eat. Uh, so do some of the woodpeckers and the crows do too. Um, I don't find them pesky. I don't find them particularly uh, annoying to the other birds. I do know that they're great trash eaters uh, and they can find and, and distribute trash around the neighborhood. But as far as being pesky, I don't know that they are. They are predators of other birds. They will rob bird nests. They will rob squirrel nests. They will eat small birds and small, uh, small mammals. But that's, that's the ecosystem. Uh, I wouldn't consider that pesky so much as that's what they're there to do. Um, somebody seems to have a neighbor like yours with a oh, very overgrown backyard, which seems to be an eyesore, but maybe instead it's a good thing, question mark? Well, I think different people can disagree on what's an eyesore. Uh, for some people, anything that isn't a golf course like lawn is an eyesore. Uh, for some people, anything that isn't the Pasadena Rose Garden is an eyesore. Uh, I think we need to re-educate our aesthetic palette uh, to look at things that are more natural, uh, that, you know, that, that reproduce and that look like and that mimic what we would have seen here 200 years ago uh, 
Uh, and if you want to see what it would have looked like here in College Park or Hyattsville or Mount Rainier or University Park, go over to um, uh, over to Patuxent South, over to the Wildlife Visitor Center and look across the lake. That's a that's pretty much what our area would have looked like. It would have been most it would have been a mix of shrub adapted trees, black gum, tulip tree, uh, red maple, and some of the upland species, chestnut oak, red oak, willow oak, and then a, a mix of, 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 of understory. I think we, you know, if you look at a relatively undisturbed area, like what you're seeing in parts of Patuxent uh, Refuge, I think that gives you a sense of what we should be appreciating aesthetically, uh, rather than the park-like settings that we've been sort of gulled into believing represent the things that are not eyesores. I mean, I got I got in in hot water with the city here a couple of times for having uh, not obeying, not being um, consistent with what was then the the code for the city of College Park, which said you couldn't have anything that was more than 12 inches high. You couldn't let your lawns grow. You couldn't have a lot of a lot of the things that we now see as natural gardens. Fine, I worked with the city. We now have a new code that allows for naturalist plantings uh, and is very responsive and one of the models for responsible planting. <clears throat> we'll still have, we'll still come to blows over the brush suspect, but uh, since they're in the backyard and well screened, and not such an issue. Uh, not a question, but a comment I think everybody would appreciate. Um, as soon as this talk is posted on the Hyattsville Aging in Place website, I'm sending it to the Hyattsville Public Works Director. I hope others will do the same. I think they would find it a good means, a, a means to support the good work she is doing with planting trees and shrubs around the city. So I think that's something we can all take to heart. I, I'll send it to Brenda Alexander, Rick, if you haven't. Um, just, uh, we'll see. Um, another question, um, can you explain uh, basically the numbers on bird loss? Three billion have been gone since 1970. Um, noting how many uh, birds were killed by cats at 2.4 billion. So if you add window strikes, that means more than 3 billion since 1970. I guess just a further explanation of the numbers of lost birds. Sure, sure. sure. Mary's been using her calculator and that's great, but let me tell you what, the, it's apples and oranges here. So the 3 billion is the the general population of adult birds year on year. So the population, if you took a census in June, say, uh, in 1970, and did that same census in 2021, that's the 3 billion you've lost, the total number of adult birds in the environment. What happens is that at the end of the breeding cycle, you may have 10 times more birds than you started out with. There's an expectation you're going to lose some to you know predation, some to storms, some don't make it to their uh, to their wintering grounds, various reasons. And the next year when they come back, not everybody's going to come back the same way. So you'll be back at your steady state. So the three billion since twenty or two billion three billion since uh, twenty nineteen seventy is from the steady state. You can have a lot of kills of the birds of the year, that is the ones that are adults, the ones that have been fledged in the first nest, the ones that have been fledged in the second nest, and cats can take a lot of those. And that just means that your steady state the next year is gonna be lower, but it's not gonna be lower by the 4 billion that the cats take out or the 2.4 billion that the cats take out. Those are still accurate numbers. They just don't reflect what the steady state number is. That, that's the predation that leads to a decline in the steady state. Back to worms for a minute. Um, don't they break down the soil and it sort of aerate it? Well, they do for those ecosystems that evolved to need having the soil aerated. As it happens, the eastern forests and the, and the forests of the New England area did not evolve to need aeration. In fact, they evolved for their microbial communities to be in non-aerated soil to be in sort of anaerobic soil. And that's why 
many of the species there we don't find really farther south like into the Appalachians and, and across over to the Mississippi River. Um, yes, they're good in a garden where your biggest issue is, you know, you, you, you have a lot of compaction. But even gardeners will tell you that tilling too much or tilling too deep is bad for your garden. It impacts the microbial communities in a negative way, and those microbial communities are critical for good plant growth, even for vegetables. And even when we've planted vegetables that have been drenched in fungicides and herbicides first, or fungicides and insecticides first. Um, but somebody wonders, uh, could you repeat some of the reasons they could um, talk to their neighbors about uh, Mosquito Joe and why he's not a good idea? Not necessarily spraying for mosquitoes overall. So there are a couple ways to control mosquitoes. First of all, um, you can control mosquitoes by controlling where they breed, which is in standing water. And that's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, for places where you have regularly standing water, there are mosquito-specific bacteria you can add to the water that will wipe out just the mosquitoes. Keep in mind, though, that there are creatures that feed on mosquitoes, and you're disrupting their food supply, too. Those just don't happen to be worms. They, they happen to be fish. They happen to be uh, invertebrates from dragonflies and, and others. Um, so when you, when you get rid, if, if it's in a natural ecosystem, living in your inner tube or your tire or your kid's play, you know, play pool out back. Nobody's, nobody cares if you get rid of those mosquitoes, that's, I promise. Um, so that's one way you can control them. Second way you can control them is by applying insecticide to yourself. So it's not that you're controlling the mosquitoes, but you're controlling and feeding on you, which is what you want to do. What I disagree with is completely changing the ecosystem so that you're comfortable. You can wear long sleeves, you can wear long pants, you can do things to keep yourselves from being bitten if that's what, you're, what you want. But what most people want is they wanna be able to put their halter top on and their shorts on and sit out in the yard and, and drink their martini and, and not have to worry about being bitten by mosquitoes. I get that, I, I swear I get that. Um, but I also know that it has exceptional impacts on the environment when you choose to alter the environment for your comfort. Um, I would say also that, you know, when you opt for mosquito spraying, and here's what we're talking about, we're talking about someone who comes in and sprays all the shrubbery and lawn in your, in your yard, and for the most part, your neighbor's yards too, because the stuff drifts. They're usually using something that is not specific to mosquitoes. They'll tell you this only kills mosquitoes. I've heard this pitch from Mosquito Joe before, but it's not. It's a broad action insecticide, usually called permethrin or one of its, uh, one of its counterparts that kills all the insects, it kills every insect it comes in contact with. It doesn't just kill mosquitoes. It's especially effective at killing mosquitoes, but it doesn't stop there. What you need, and this is why Mosquito Joe and others uh, are not the best solutions to this problem is because it's, you know, it's an elephant gun to kill a mosquito, literally. Um, you're killing everything in order to get rid of the mosquitoes. Some people may think that's acceptable. I'm not among them, but again, good people, fine people with good hearts and good minds can differ on that, particularly when they worry about the health of their children. Probably unnecessarily, but they worry about the health of their children. For the last question, since it's 328, um, I'm picking one that will be near and dear to your heart. How can I get hummingbirds to find my feeder, feeder and to find my feeder out for the first time? Um, two things you need to know about hummingbirds. Uh, one, we don't have a lot of them to stay here. Our big push of hummingbirds is in April and May, and most of those go north of here. You know, it's their in migration. Some stay here, and they raise their young and raise their nests here. Um, sometimes they find your feeder. Feeders are very active usually in April and May and it drops off and we wonder why because there are hummingbirds here. Well, hummingbirds actually switch their diet to mostly eating insects and spiders and that's what they feed their young. So when they're nesting and they're feeding their young, they're feeding them small insects, worms, spiders, the same caterpillars everybody else is feeding them. 
And then when those young are out of the nest and when those young switch their diets over to nectar, then they always be, then they begin to come back to flowers again. And you'll see in our native plant cycle, native flowers have this big flowering cycle. We call it the spring ephemerals in April and May. And then there's not a lot, you know, you have the summer goes by and summer goes by and then suddenly July, August, you have this next big flush of flowers that come out. Uh, and that's what the hummingbirds are, are adapted to. They're adapted to these flushes of flowers. The best way to get them to come to your feeder is to hang your feeder in a plant that already attracts them. Honeysuckles, we have native honeysuckles, coral honeysuckles are one of their favorites. Um, things that have those long tubular sort of flowers, they'll come to those. Some of the non-native things you can plant there are cypress vine, um, very attractive to them as well. Dwarf red buckeye, actually. Dwarf red buckeye and cross vine, if you, these are two native vines, or a native vine and a native shrub that begin to bloom and they are found all the way from Alabama, Georgia, Carolinas, all the way up the spine of the Appalachians and the coast up to about New Jersey, New York. Um, hummingbirds, follow the blooms of those plants when they migrate north. That's, that's what dictates how fast they move north, is the availability of those plants. You know, don't, don't dye the color of the water. That, that doesn't, help the, doesn't help much at all. Uh, if you have a little bit of red on the feeder itself, you know, the red flowers, or the red tubes, that will, that will attract them. The dyes themselves are harmful to, to, uh, to hummingbirds. Rick, this was fabulous. And I think if you have access to the chat, um, brave reviews. Um, we're very grateful to you for doing this. Um, I appreciate everybody joining today. I um, want to remind you of our next, uh, next session will be Saturday, June 26th. In the meantime, have a happy Memorial Day and enjoy those cicadas. Thank you very much.